it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Somewhere in the north woods darkness, a creature walks upright. And the best advice you may ever get is never to go out at night. The Legend of Michigan's Dogman by C.R. Productions The Song Well, a very strange thing happened after the poem was aired on radio on April 1st, 1987, and it became obvious the story was not going to fade away. The first two times the song was played, there was no viewer reaction or calls. Cook and O'Malley were prepared to let the failed prank die, when suddenly the phone line started lighting up. People were calling in asking about that weird song. Listeners asked, who did that song on the Dogman thing, and when are you going to play it again? O'Malley took a call from an elderly man who stated that he was chilled to the bone after hearing the song because he'd actually seen a similar creature years before. Well, that was the first of many sighting reports that would pour into the station over the next few weeks. Scores of people told of stories and encounters with a creature that was very much like Cook's fabricated dogman. Within one month, the legend of the dogman became the most requested song on the air, and for a short time was added into the regular rotation of the music. Other stories began to surface and be compared to the Michigan Dogman story. A century old, a mysterious Indian legend revealed shocking similarities. A French fur trader's diary from 1804 told of an encounter with Loup Garou. A letter from 1857 described a creature that stood upright like a man yet bore the countenance of a grey wolf. A real dogman sighting investigated by Lake County Sheriff's Deputy Jeff Chamberlain, who was accompanied by Department of Natural Resources Officer Ron McCarty, was picked up and reported on by Mark Marantet, a reporter for the Cadillac Evening News. Then other news outlets picked up the story, and it was later fed down the Associated Press newswire, and thus was picked up by newspapers all across America. It was even mentioned as a strange coincidence in Paul Harvey's national news and comments broadcast. McCarty called the TV station, WTCM, stating that he and Chamberlain had openly joked about how this sighting would fit in with the seventh year prophecy made in the song. McCarty's voice would later appear in the beginning of the 10th anniversary version of the song, The Legend of 97. Suddenly, the legend soared into national prominence and became a hit song once again only this time on a much larger scale. Requests for copies came in from all 50 states and around the world. Eventually, the master tape, never considered to be of real value, had been destroyed, and Steve Cook went into the studio again, this time with an upgraded keyboard, and recorded the song a second time. A few changes were made to the lyrics to update the legend for summer. When it was finished, the second master recording was shipped to Southfield, Michigan for mass production. The first 500 copies arrived a week later, and sold out in 12 days. The legend had quickly become hot property, with record stores and radio stations across the country calling the station requesting copies. A large record company offered to record and promote the song, and Steve Cook faced the difficult decision of whether to release the legend on a national scale, or to keep it local and manageable. Well, Steve chose to keep it local. The music and lyrics were copyrighted by Mindstage Productions, Cook's marketing and advertising company. More and more copies of the tape, which was originally priced at $3, were sold, and in the fall of 1987, WTCM held an art contest which allowed amateur artists the chance to submit works depicting what they thought the Dogman looked like. There were over a hundred entries. Some were exceptional, but by far the most chilling and dramatic was an 11 by 17 charcoal sketch done by Brian Rosinski, who was only 23 years old at the time and had never had a formal art lesson. Well, the song was never intended to be a marketable vehicle for profit, and Cook made the decision early on that any profits earned derived from its sale would be donated to charity. 
The first charity was the Traverse City Cherryland Humane Society, which scored two and a half thousand dollars towards drilling a new water well and the remodeling of the adult dog facility, which included new floor tile and pens. In 2001, Cook was introduced to Brian Manley, founder of AC Poor, a no-kill animal rescue program that specializes in lost causes. AC Poor takes in animals that have been injured, abused, or neglected, or that have used up the maximum boarding time in traditional facilities and are about to be euthanized. They rehabilitate animals through a unique foster care network and eventually place them in a loving home. Now, Cook was so impressed with the AC Poor program, he shifted all donations from the proceeds of the legend to their cause, and thus the legend of the dogman's legacy lives on for animals in need. While the legend has never been formally distributed for airplay on other radio stations, it's been heard across the USA and the world. Many young adults grew up hearing it and remember it scaring them at summer campfire storytelling sessions. The legend has inspired movie screenplays, stage productions, numerous books, term papers, at least one master's thesis, and countless classroom projects at all grade levels. In spite of the initial belief that the song would be a radio bit designed to run one day only, interest in the legend continues to grow. Steve Cook receives 10 to 20 reported sightings each year, many supported by dramatic evidence. Perhaps the best description of the legacy of the legend came from WTCM morning host Jack O'Malley. This song has been firmly woven into the fabric of northern Michigan. It's part of the culture now, part of the folklore. The legend will be here long after we are gone. The Gable Film This is the first recorded evidence of the Dogman. In an estate sale, an old film was found in a box. After viewing it, a home video of a strange attack was discovered. The film shows a young boy filming normal family stuff, until a truck ride passing by a field shows a creature of some sort. They stop the truck and film the creature until it charges to attack. The attack is somewhat caught on tape and even shows the mouth of the animal. The mouth rules out ape and dog origin. Some people claim this is the Dogman. Encounters Big Rapids, 1961 oh, When I was a boy, my father was the night watchman at a manufacturing plant located in a rural area between Big Rapids and Chippewa Lake, Michigan. Our house, which if I remember right was a perk of the night watchman job, was across the street from the factory. The plant building was right next to a large wilderness area of state land. At that time it was simply known as the Haymarsh, but now it's officially called the Haymarsh State Game Area. We didn't understand it at the time, but Dad was always getting very skittish about letting us play outside after dark. He'd sometimes talk about hearing coyotes or bears roaming around in the Haymarsh when he was walking the perimeter of the building at night. One night in the summer of 1961, Dad walked back to the house to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee in his sweet room. He had a good view of the entire plant property. We saw some movement near a chain-link fence behind the building. This was approximately 3 a.m., so he felt quite sure this person wasn't there by accident. He drew his gun and watched for a few minutes. That's when he noticed this was not a person at all, but something much taller. He said it appeared to be covered in brown, gray hair. It had very broad shoulders and a powerful chest. It alternated between walking on four legs and then standing up on two. He said it seemed to be looking for something along the driveway. He said later he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. He quietly moved into the house and grabbed his Kodak Signet 35mm camera, which was his pride and joy. At this point, I should mention that Dad was quite a photography buff. His father had owned one of the first camera stores in Ohio and Dad got the shutter bug from Grandpa. As he stepped back onto the front porch, the creature moved slowly along the driveway, directly under the lights. He adjusted the camera shutter for a long exposure, held it as still as he could, well, he said he was shaking pretty badly by then, and snapped a picture. Well, I've enclosed a print of it in this letter. 
Dad said a few seconds later the thing dropped back down to all fours and slowly moved off into the woods. He sent a print to the local newspaper and sent copies to several magazines. One that I think was called Mysterion published the photo in their spring issue of 1962. Dad had a copy of the magazine for years, but it was misplaced after he passed away. Well, I still have the negative strip that contains this image, if you'd like to have someone examine it. I also still have Dad's Kodak Signet. I haven't shot any pictures with it for several years, but I'm pretty sure it still works. Sparta, 1987. One week back around fall of 1987, my two best friends and I were staying at my family's cabin, which is not far from the small town of Sparta, about 20 minutes north of Grand Rapids. My two friends left to have dinner while I stayed behind at the cabin. Following the dinner, the man headed back towards Sparta in the cabin. What happened next would shock and disturb them for years. It was dark. They were on a rural road. Suddenly both of them saw something standing by the side of the road. In the headlights of the car, it appeared to be a human-like figure covered in grey fur. As they got closer and passed the figure... Both of them got a very good look at it. It was the size of a man, stood on two legs, and was covered head to toe in grey fur, and a wolf-like face. It even raised its hands and seemed to snarl at them as they drove by. They said it looked like a werewolf out of some Hollywood movie. But my friends didn't dare stop, just continued driving, and of course they were peppering each other with questions. Hey, did you see that too? Was that a dog? Was that someone dressed up in a costume? And so on. As they were having this animated conversation, they passed by the sign that says, Welcome to Sparta, and drove through the small main street and continued on out of the town in the direction of my cabin. The conversation about what had just happened continued when both of them looked up to see that same Welcome to Sparta sign again, followed by the same main street they'd just driven through only moments ago. Well, they hadn't stopped or turned around. They'd been traveling in the same direction on the same road. But somehow, without any noticeable interruption in their journey, they'd somehow been sent backwards several miles. But until this point, it'd be easy to dismiss this event as someone playing a joke. However, the time displacement characteristic is what sets this encounter apart. While such things are well documented in UFO and alien abduction stories, it's something we've not seen before in Dogman sighting reports. And he continues. I remember when they finally showed up in my cabin. They arrived no later than what I expected them to, around 9pm or so. I remember how animated they were about their strange encounter. I just assumed they'd seen a large dog and were telling me an embellished story in order to get a laugh. But, uh, well, 20 years later... Both of them still insist this was no joke. I have no idea what to make of this story. Maybe it was just some teenagers in a werewolf costume playing pranks. Did my friends really experience lost time afterwards? Or did they just make some wrong turns on their drive and didn't notice because they were talking and distracted? Well, I have no idea. But I'd love to know if anyone else has seen similar things in the Sparta area. Reed City, 1993. The area around Reed City, Michigan, has been a hotbed of dogman activity. Now, this report details an event that occurred nearly 20 years ago, but the witness remembers it like it was yesterday, and is unshakable in her story. Her name is Courtney, and her encounter took place during the winter of 1993-94. Courtney was a teenager at the time, was sneaking cigarettes behind her parents' home near Todd Lake, northeast of Reed City. The sun was setting on a clear, cold winter day. Courtney was facing a large, abandoned barn on the property next door. Well, that barn's always kind of spooked me. Filled with rusty old equipment. The outer planks were all rotten, and it sagged and leaned in every direction. My dad said to stay away, as the whole thing could collapse. Well, on that evening, I was standing about 50 feet from the bar. I saw sunlight coming through the gaps in the siding. 
Courtney had taken her eyes off the barn for a few minutes, and then something caught her attention again. Yeah, there was some movement. The light flickered, but I couldn't really tell what it was. Then it turned its head back and looked straight at me. I was at least six feet tall, if not more. It was dark-colored. It had a dog-like appearance. You know, pointy nose and really big, pointy ears. Oh, Courtney had dashed into her house to grab a flashlight. When she returned outside, she shone it toward the barn door, but the animal was no longer there. She walked closer to the barn to look for tracks in the heavy snow. When she didn't see any, she realized the creature might still be inside and ran back to the safety of the house. She never saw the creature again. She later talked to a neighbor who'd seen something. Oh, the size of a buffalo, but the shape of a dog. In the same barn a few months before Courtney's encounter. The neighbor said she'd been so frightened she was near hysterics for days. Her father had taken his gun and searched the barn, but found nothing there. Well, at the time of these events, neither of the girls had heard of the legend song, and didn't know about the Michigan Dogman legend until years later. Water's Meat, 1994 and this report comes to us from an anonymous contributor who grew up in Cheboygan County, but spent many summers camping on family property in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This encounter took place in the area of Watersmeet, home of the famous Paulding Lights phenomenon. Oddly enough, the Paulding Lights are also known as the Dog Meadow Lights. When I was 13. Just got a new rollerblades for Christmas, and since the main road where our property sits is paved, I couldn't wait to ride around. Went blading by myself and stopped to rest for a second. On this road, the woods are so thick, there's not much space between the road and the woods in most parts. And I remember seeing trees pushed down on the road that my dad said was done by bears. Well, he was an avid bear hunter. I remember not hearing any of your normal sounds of nature, not even birds. Well, the air was still and the sky would be pure dark in not too long. I was deciding to turn back when I heard a rustling behind me, and something emerged from the left side of the road. I assumed it was a deer and paused and made myself as quiet as I could so I could watch it, and slumped down on my stomach in the middle of the road. It was about 600 feet ahead of me. When I got myself settled in the road to watch it and looked up, I realized what I was looking at wasn't a deer. It was on all fours with this gray brown fur, first I feared the worst, thinking a bear had caught my scent, until I saw its outline and color. I thought I was looking at a dog until I realized the face was too oh, primitive, like a fox or a coyote's. At this point in my life, I'd never seen a wolf in real life. It was too far for me to make out the face exactly. Well, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources has always recognized that wild wolves still roamed the Upper Peninsula although they were thought to be in very limited numbers, and only in extremely remote areas. It is conceivable this witness was seeing one of these wolves, but then, something very strange happened. Well, I extended its front legs, and in the slowest, longest seconds of my life, stood up on its hind legs, sniffed the air, and walked for about five steps. Then it got back down on all fours and walked to the other side of the woods, and then, well, disappeared. I don't remember how long I laid in the middle of the road staring into the empty space I saw this thing stand like a human. I remember my jaw hanging down as low as it could, and a pool of drool on the cement under it. Well, it finally clicked in my mind that perhaps I should roll a blade my butt back to camp as quick as I could. The witness then reports that while the creature never stalked or pursued her, she slept very little during the rest of the family camping trip. She never told anyone about what she'd seen, fearing she'd be ridiculed. At the time of the sighting, she'd never heard of the legend song, and would not until 2004. She moved to Southern California in 2008 and has no interest in camping ever again. Alpena 2001. My dad and I have a story to tell about our encounters with the Dogman. My dad's story took place in the mid-70s. 
There's a cemetery behind the Alpena High School and a wooded area behind that. There are many trails that run through here. In this area is a place called the Sandies, where all the young kids would go and party. My dad and two of his buddies were in a canoe in broad daylight paddling from the Sandies around the back of the cemetery. The banks of the river are 10 to 12 feet high in places, and some trails run right to the edge. Well, the three of them saw what looked to be a big dog running behind them on the trail. They didn't pay much attention to it until they heard a splash. When they looked, it was swimming after them. Then it went from a dog paddle to the chest and front legs coming out of the water and wading after them. Well, they decided right then not to wait around to see what it was. Honestly, I thought it was BS at the time. I'm still not sure even to this day if it was something that they'd been smoking or drinking. Well then, around 2001, 2002, I was leading some friends through the Sandy's trails. I used to like taking people out there without a flashlight and telling my dad's story to freak him out. Well, the girls freaked out before we even got into the woods, so I decided not to scare them that night. In the river, a small, well, several small islands connected by a small sliver of land. At that time, there were three such islands chained together, I took them through to the last one, which was planted with pines in nice, even rows. Well, I was the first one back there, about thirty seconds ahead, when one of the girls got her foot hung up on something. As I was going back to help her, there was a spot where the trees make a sort of roof effect, which is really cool, looking at the night with the moon shining through. At that point, I saw something. I'm not sure what it was, but it sent me running out double time. When my buddy saw my face, he didn't say a word. He just followed, both of us dragging the girls behind us. When he asked me later why I'd come out in such a hurry, I told him it's because I thought I'd seen something at the other end of the island, walking through the trees that was very tall and not likely human. Now, he may not have believed me, but he never questioned it either. Well, I'm still not sure what I saw. Could easily have been that I scared myself with my dad's story, and I was seeing things, but hey, I know this. I still don't like the dark, and even though I love hunting, I hate going out before the sun comes up during deer season. Bandon, 2007 now This sighting report is told secondhand by the brother-in-law of the witness. The witness is a prominent person in local government, and wishes to remain anonymous. Oh, this situation started last Saturday night around midnight when he was coming home from a friend's house in Benzonia and taking the back way home to Traverse City. He stated that while traveling down Cinder Road, several miles outside of the town of Bandon, he observed a pair of eyes reflecting off his headlights ahead of him. Thinking that it was probably a deer alongside of the road, he began to slow down. As he got closer, however, he stated that the object was much larger and much darker than a deer. He said that by this time he'd slowed down to around 30 miles an hour and was at that point several hundred feet from the creature, which still hadn't moved. As he approached further, he stated that the only way he could describe the creature was being similar to a very large dark wolf. However, he observed that this thing wasn't on four legs, but was upright two back legs standing near a rogue killed deer. He estimated that the creature stood a little over six feet tall and had very dark fur. Well, he stated that by now he was going slow enough to bring his truck to a stop in the road and observe the creature which had not yet moved and was still staring at him. He told me that for a brief second he believed that the object was a giant stuffed animal put there as some kind of joke. Well, due to the fact that he'd never seen anything like it in his life before, that he was able to drive up to it as close as he was without it having moved an inch. He told me, however, that before he could finish that thought, the creature then dropped to all four legs and sprinted across the road and disappeared into the woods on the other side of the roadway. He told me that he stayed frozen in his seat for a minute, wandering in the middle of the road of what the heck had just happened. I jokingly asked him if he'd been drinking that night. With a deadly serious face, he stated, No, whatever that was, it was for real. As perplexed as he was that night over what he'd seen, he 
he was deathly afraid to go wandering into the woods to investigate further. He said that in using a flashlight, he observed an animal's tracks leading into the woods on the opposite side of the road, and was fortunate enough that night to have his digital camera with him. He showed me a photograph of the paw print, which he said appeared to be about seven or eight inches long. He had another picture of the same paw print where he placed a shotgun shell in the middle of it for scale. He told me that he was lucky that the side of the road was so soft, because he wasn't willing to go any further than two or three steps away from the door of his truck to get a picture. I inquired if the animal had made any sounds before it disappeared, and he said that he didn't hear it make any noise, and were it not for the picture, he would have thought that he'd imagined the whole thing. I asked him if it could have been a bear, and he stated, No, absolutely not. He bear hunts every year in the Upper Peninsula, so he obviously knows what bears look like up close. And that's his story. Believe it if you like. I didn't know him as well as I do, and hadn't seen the pictures. I would have said he was out of his mind. I've heard the song and know some of the stories. I always believed it was just for entertainment value. Well, after this happened, though, I'm looking at all of this under a whole new light. Author's note. Send me an email if you've ever had an encounter with this creature. I might add your story to the encounters list. The Wolfman of Willow Lane by Corpse Child. I'm afraid of the moon. Now, as stupid as I know that sounds, I am. I'm afraid of the moon. I'm afraid because of what it can do to people. Lunacy. Lunatic. Both have two things in common. They both mean insane or crazy, and they both have something to do with the moon. Well, they did back in the day, before they just became two more words to get thrown around wildly. But just think about it. So much of what we associate with insanity, we attribute to some effect of the moon. We've wondered for years if there's any sort of truth to it. Is there? I hear you asking. Well, I really can't say, though I'm definitely considering the possibility. Whatever it is that does it, one thing has been made very painfully clear to me. There are forces in this world that, at any moment, can make themselves known to each and every one of us and bind us to their will. And there's not a damn thing we can do about it. I want you to remember those words as you listen to this. I wish someone could have told me this when it all happened just a few months ago. It had been a thing for at least a year or two, but it was only a few months ago that things really took a one-way trip to Bizarro Land. The Wolfman of Willow Lane. Probably one of Weeping Willow's greatest headlines since 2019, when a bunch of the kids apparently used to go missing. I moved into Willow Lane back, in late 2020. The place was exactly what I needed. An affordable roof over my head inside a quiet, well, quiet at the time, neighborhood. People weren't much the type to throw block parties or neighborhood barbecues, or even the type to come out and shout, Hey there, neighbor. I know that might put some people off the utter silent solitude. But not me. No. I loved it. I moved in from Dallas, and I was in one of the main residential areas, the ones you see closest to the grocery stores, which meant I might as well have been living in Times Square with all the noise and traffic that flew by every day. Yeah, it would only get worse at night. This, in short, was a perfect match for me. A dream home, if you will. Well, this dream lasted until at least mid-2021. It was last summer when I started hearing the howling at night time. And it was loud, too, enough to where I began having trouble sleeping. Thing is, though, I couldn't just blame the dogs for why I couldn't sleep. I had measures to help against noise. Well, how do you think I made it back in Dallas? ASMR. Rainfall ambience. Podcasts. Stuff like that were the things I'd use regularly to help me sleep. Occasionally, I took pills as well. I was told to watch how much of that stuff I used. Well, apparently it can mess with my natural melatonin 
and even serotonin output, according to my doctor. But neither one was working this time. I had no idea why at the time, but I just couldn't go to sleep. For whatever reason, my brain just would not turn off. And so, after feebly attempting to shut my eyes and get some sleep, I smashed the fuck it button and decided to do what any other person in my situation would do. Brew a pot of Maxwell House and browse the internet till dawn. I couldn't find any really interesting articles on Google to read about, or any interesting posts on Facebook or anything, so I eventually just settled for binging Hulu. The thing was, though, even with this I couldn't relax. I felt jittery. No, it wasn't the coffee. I felt on edge the entire time, you know. Well, eventually I gave up with Hulu and just decided to turn on one of my playlists and see if I could maybe just relax that way. Just yeah, some background noise to stir my brain enough that my body could relax. Well, it kind of worked. I was still wide awake, but not to a point where I looked like an alcoholic around the coffee pot, if you take my meaning. I couldn't help but to look outside, listening to the dogs howling at the night sky. Looking up at the sky, I could see the big, bright, waxing moon glaring down back at me. I remember thinking how bold it looked, raised high in the sky like that. Not like a lion who was fighting vigorously to break the confines of the night sky, desperately trying to expose its full auroral beauty for the world to see. It was hypnotic in a way. Eventually the constant howling sort of blended into my trance, the way an alarm clock does when you're asleep. Travelling into your dream and becoming a sort of background noise. That's what happened with me. I was in a dream, essentially. A waking dream. I was fully conscious, yet the world around me was gone. There was me, and the moon, oh, and the damn dogs. I guess I fell asleep that night. I guess you could say I woke up at some point too, regardless of whether or not I was actually asleep, to see, then, that it was daylight out. I was still on my couch, in front of my laptop, like I was the night before. I'd actually stared up at that moon all freaking night. I felt exhausted, obviously, but at the same time, something made me feel somewhat, well, somewhat invigorated. Like mentally, I was tired as hell, but my body felt like I wanted to go and run a 5k or some shit. It didn't make any sense to me. Regardless, I managed to slug my way through the morning. Unfortunately, I didn't have to work the next few days, so I thought I could maybe make up for the lost sleeping time. But nope. Couldn't even settle down enough for a mid-afternoon nap. My body was just too damn primed. Not only that, but for whatever reason, I couldn't take my mind off of the moon. Every time I'd close my eyes, even just for a second, I'd see it. It'd be looming down, lording over me, almost like it was watching me in a way. I could almost hear it, if that makes any kind of sense. Uh, probably just an exhausted brain. Sure, well, that's what I chalked it up to anyways. But I actually felt like somehow the moon was speaking to me. Yeah, I know that makes no sense. It wasn't any easier for me to try and understand either. But that's what it was like. The moon was calling to me. Eh, whatever, I thought. Just a bad run with insomnia, that's all. Just grit your teeth and get through the day. Maybe down a few shots of Jack or, hell, glug some NyQuil. Things will go back to normal tonight. Well, the joke was on me. Yeah, I had a few shots of Jack, yeah. I went out and picked up some NyQuil and took some before bed. Even downing almost twice the recommended amount per dosage. No, didn't do a damn thing all night. I was still too energized for whatever reason. And the next two or three nights following were absolutely no better. By the end of the week, I was looking and feeling like a 65-year-old man who'd had a hip replacement despite the fact I was only 20 at the time. I remember it was actually while I was on hold on the phone that Saturday morning, making an appointment with the doctor about this problem, that I would first hear about it. I had the TV on the Today Show, while on hold when a breaking news broadcast came on. On the screen was a photo of two teenagers splayed on the ground, looking like they'd been mauled by a freaking lion. Their faces were censored, but just judging from their height, I'd have to say that neither one of them could have been any older than maybe 17. The headline read, 
Team Couple found dead outside of a local park. Now, according to the report, they had been found only about an hour and a half ago. They said police were canvassing the area for any possible suspects who they believe may have been or may still be lingering in the woods nearby. Well, this got my attention, sending my heart racing. That park was only about a few miles down the road from my neighborhood. The broadcast then went on to detail how, evidently, there had been an unusual amount of dogs barking nearby all through the day as well. It's unknown at this time whether the sounds have any sort of connection with the murder. The reporter continued, but animal involvement has not been ruled out. At this time, authorities have advised that residents keep any dogs inside their homes or inside of an adequate shelter. Police are also temporarily closing the park to visitors until further notice. We'll inform you as the situation develops. Well, I muted the TV after that. I didn't want to hear anymore. I was on edge. <sighs> what if the maniac's still out there? I remember rushing to the window and frantically throwing the curtains shut before realizing that, in my panic, I was still holding the phone in my hand. Sure enough, right as I held the phone to my ear, I was taken off hold and I heard a middle-aged woman's voice say, Hello? Johnsonville Urgent Care? This is Linda. How may I help you? Um, uh, yeah, I answered, starting to feel queasy. I'd, uh, I'd like to make an appointment. All right, sir. Can I have your name and birth date? As I was starting to answer, I started to hear the dogs from outside riling up again, barking loudly, viciously. Yeah, um, Quintel Pierce, um, August 5th, 1990. I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat that for me? Uh, well, my name or... Uh... Well, just hold on, sir. I can't hear you. This time I shouted into the receiver. I said, my name is... Sir? Are there any pets in the room? I barely heard her ask this. No, I shouted. N no, Look, it's the dogs from outside. Look, my name is Quintel Pierce and... Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid I'm going to have to put you on hold for a moment. No, wait, don't... But it was too late. Before I knew it, I heard the please hold message followed by the stock elevator music. I decided to give up after that. Well, honestly, after the news report, I didn't feel safe going outside, even to the doctors. So there went another night. Restless, unable to relax at all. Of course, this time, on top of feeling unusually hyperactive, well, physically anyways, I was also anxious about the deranged freak out there, likely not far from the house, who had just mauled two kids in the park. Ah, oh, you see, I don't have a gun or anything. Not even a Louisville slugger. I never needed one, even as noisy as it was back in Dallas. Plus, my whole point of coming to Willow Lane in the first place was to live somewhere with peace and quiet. But now, things were, in multiple ways, louder and more chaotic than ever. Regardless, I powered through that night and the next, as well as the next after that. The bad, well, worse news was that I actually had to work that Tuesday morning. Oh, just for a second, imagine what it would be like to try and sit for eight hours straight answering phone calls for tech support when you've had literally no sleep whatsoever freaking ever for the last eight days straight, or while your body feels like it's on a constant roid rage. Well, as funny as that sounds, let me tell you right now, that was truly a pain in the ass day to have to get through. Oh, by nothing short of a miracle, I actually managed to slug my way through. Helped, no doubt, by the fact that most people's problems were fixed with a simple try turning the device off and back on again. On the way home, I stopped by the CVS and picked up the strongest nighttime meds I could get my hands on. I also took the liberty while I was out to get myself a pocket knife. It wasn't much, granted, but it made me feel a lot safer than having nothing at all. That night, the meds actually seemed to work a little, or at least in terms of not feeling quite as energized. I still ended up having to take almost three times the recommended dosage before. For the first night that week, I finally got some damn sleep. That said, that was when a new phenomenon occurred. In my dreams, there, leering down at me like the terrifying, enraged eye of God, was the moon. 
Though here, unlike what you'd normally expect of the moon, I could feel some sort of heat, like from a blazing star radiating from it. It wasn't overwhelming, but instead, well, instead it was alluring in a weird sort of way. You could probably go with any number of scientific reasons as to why, but I couldn't help but want to reach out and touch it, hold it even, like I was a moth flying towards a thousand watt light bulb. It didn't move, yet it was alive. Actually, looking hard enough directly into it, I saw that it seemed to vibrate, resonating quicker and quicker by the second. Then, in the voice of easily the most beautiful woman I'd ever heard, it says to me, Come, join the pack. I say nothing. Obviously, for one thing, I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to mean. But secondly, because I'm still speechless in awe of this gargantuan cosmic marvel. This terrifying yet gentle colossus of the cosmos. From around me I see black shapes begin zipping around all over. Circling me, like bestial shapes with glaring yellow eyes and long, jagged ivory fangs. All racing around me, growling. They get closer and closer. Come. I call you to come. Join the pack and we'll take what's ours. The beasts then swarm me, covering me in darkness. Well, I snapped awake after that, only to find that I wasn't in my house anymore. Looking around, I found myself sprawled out in a patch of grass just outside the gate of the park. What the hell? was my first reaction. I looked down and my eyes widened further, seeing that my clothes were all raggedy and unkempt. I looked like I'd passed out after getting shit-faced. And even more alarming was how dirty my hands were. The dirt was covering them all over, in and under my fingernails, and there were multiple splotches of dirt all over my shirt as well. I looked around. It was still just hitting daybreak. No one else was there. I began picking myself up when I found something that made me both scream and puke almost simultaneously. Underneath me, was a half-eaten carcass of a squirrel. Well, almost out of some delayed reaction or cue, I immediately began noticing a foul taste in my mouth, and it wasn't the vomit. It tasted metallic, as well as slimy and furry. I gagged again. Oh my god, what's going on? Did I... God, did I eat this squirrel? Well, suffice to say, I was well beyond freaked the hell out. Taking one last scan of the area, seeing no one was still around, I scrambled back to my house. Though the walk was only just down the road from my house, like I said earlier, my entire body felt so incredibly sore that the usual three to four mile walk ended up feeling more like a ten mile one, while having a hundred and eighty pound brick of lead strapped to my back. When I finally did make it back to my house, I locked the door, again something I wasn't ever used to doing previously, before slugging my way into the bathroom for a bath. As all of this was happening, my brain was caught in a typhoon of questions. Questions like, what was going on with me? And, what happened last night? These were just the itty-bitty tip of this iceberg. The most frightening of these being the question of, what really happened to those two kids the other night? Well, this was only made worse when, as I was getting out of my clothes, a closer look at the stains on my shirt revealed that they weren't dirt at all. No, they were splotches of blood. Well, this made me sick yet again. It was true. I'd done it. I'd eaten that squirrel alive. Well, more than queasiness, I felt myself become more and more anxious. If I'd done that to an animal, then... Could I have been the one to murder those kids? This inevitably led me down a seemingly endless rabbit hole for the whole rest of the week. Each day, on top of feeling jittery every night from whatever had been making me feel as such before, which was already leaving me mentally exhausted, now I was also feeling paranoid that someone was going to notice. I was especially worried, though, about the possibility that the police would catch up to me. 
I mean, sure, I said nobody was around when I woke up in the park covered in blood. But even still, if I was the one who'd murdered those two before, then I knew it wouldn't be too much longer before they connected the dots and found me. That was probably the worst thing about this whole mess. The fact that I knew, at any moment, I was going to be discovered. I thought about wanting to turn myself in. You know, spare the extra drama and trouble. But that was the other thing about this whole mess that made it all the more confusing to me. How did I know it actually was me in the park that night? Yeah, okay, the squirrel was my doing, and sure, the victims had been found in basically the exact same condition. But were both of them my fault? None of it made any sense to me. I tried thinking about each night prior, about how constantly full of energy I was despite being half dead mentally. But no matter how hard I tried, no answers came to me. None that made any sense to me, at least. Well, that is, except for one that lingered in the back of my head. The events before, the abnormal insomnia, the dogs barking, the murders, the freaky-ass dream, the uh, incident with the squirrel, all had one thing in common. The moon. I thought again to the times I'd stared at it, hypnotized by it. In doing this, I realized. Each night I looked at it, it became more and more full. Well, this got me wondering. Stupid as this is about to sound, believe me, I was slapping myself just as hard for the suggestion back then. I began to wonder if I might be some kind of werewolf or something. Well, granted, the only sort of logic, and again, using that term very loosely, behind this theory being the animalistic behavior and again the whole squirrel thing. But at the same time, what was it talking about in the dream about joining the pack? I decided to look online at the sleeping medications I'd picked up the night I blacked out. I thought maybe they could be some sort of psychotropic or hallucinogenic properties, which might explain that dream, even if the question as to why I'd been so restless before would still be a mystery. As I figured, though, nothing. Uh, they were just regular sleeping medications, although seeing that they weren't actually any more potent than the NyQuil I'd taken before, I was left with yet another question. Was it actually the meds that put me to sleep that night? Like I said, it was a far-fetched notion. About as far as you'll get. But at the same time, I had no rational ideas either. All I had were pieces, but no picture. Well, outside of the possibility that I'd murdered two innocent kids without even knowing it, and did it again with a live animal. With no other leads, I caved internally and started searching up articles and videos talking about werewolves. There are different mythos, strengths, weaknesses, and ways of becoming one and whatnot. Most results that weren't about the Lon Chaney Jr. movie just detailed the usual werewolf shtick. Big, extremely strong, superhuman speed, agility and senses. Extremely hostile. And the whole comes out under a full moon routine, were basically the gist of all of them. Some listed different variants or breeds of werewolf, such as the Loop Garou, Vricolacus, and even a few mentions of the Skinwalker from native folklore. All of this proved essentially useless, though, for one big thing. All of these detailed the ways in becoming a werewolf as either having some sort of contact with another one, or having performed some satanic ritual or some shit neither of which I've done. So, with no kind of leads and starting to feel the onset of a bad headache, I ended my search there for the time being. That night the TV played another breaking news broadcast regarding the case from the other night. This time, though, it was different for a couple of big reasons. The first being that this was a report of another body being found half-devoured in the park. This time it was an elderly man who was apparently out late walking with his wife and dog when it happened. Apparently, out of nowhere, some giant animal or beast jumped from one of the nearby trees and snatched him, well, according to the wife's statement on the camera. She'd apparently called the police when it happened, which was only a few days before at that time, by the way, who then began searching for him. It was only an hour before the broadcast that night, though, that they'd found what remained of him in the hedge grove only about three or so feet from the spot where I'd woken up with a squirrel. 
Well, now, I was panicking. That was on the same night. The night of the attack. That was the same night I'd blacked out. The room began spinning, causing me to feel lightheaded. Well, that was it. I'd done it. I'd mauled at least one person to death. Even if I could have denied it with the kids from before, who else could it be this time? The broadcast went on to display a composite sketch of the creature based on the wife's description. Looking at it, I noticed that it didn't really look much like a dog or wolf. In fact, it looked almost like a regular guy, just perhaps a bit hairier. According to the report, the wife claimed the beast was six foot four tall with ragged looking clothing. She also claimed it was growling at her like a dog or wolf, and she could see it bearing what she described as being sharp, ivory teeth and canines like needles. The report ended with the beast being dubbed the Wolf Man of Willow Lane. My heart was racing, beating dangerously quicker and quicker by the second. God, they're looking for me. As well as this, though, I felt agitated, excited. I was shaking violently like I had before, feeling like I wanted to go outside and just start running. Just run and run, not having any direction or destination in mind. Just running. It felt primal, like an ingrained instinct. It was like something was compelling me to run outside. A force that I couldn't, nor wanted to, resist. Join the pack and we'll take what's ours. I heard the dogs begin barking again, creating a uniformed ambience that ended up making me drowsy. Before I knew it, everything had gone black for me. I found myself in the same dream from before, staring at the moon leering down at me while black, shapeless beasts swarm around me. This time I hear them speak, growling as they run. Run with the pack, brother. The dream ended as before, with them all swarming me, engulfing me. Well, when I woke up this time, I was laid out, buck ass nude, in the middle of the alley between the coffee shop and the hardware store downtown. Like before, the muscles and joints in my body felt tight, and I felt nauseous. I ended up having to hide out in the alley dumpster for a while, being that it was broad daylight when I woke up and therefore people would be out and about. I figured it would be best not to draw any kind of attention by walking out in the open, presenting myself in the bar. That said, it was damn near sundown before the activity outside died down and I'd finally be able to come out and make my way home without being seen. By that point, I was beyond giving a rat's ass about what had happened that night or where my clothes had gone. I only cared about going home and collapsing in my bed. Hell, I didn't even care about showering this time. It was on that long walk home, though, that a thought occurred to me. These things, me waking up in random places after blacking out, are all happening as I fall asleep. Not only that, but again, it's always as I'm staring at or thinking about the moon. But why? What was the moon doing that could cause this, if anything at all? How was it able to do so, and for what purpose, if any? The biggest question, though, was if and or how I could make it stop if it was something with the moon. At about the point where I'd exit the downtown area, toward where the park was, I heard a noise, like the growling of a giant dog coming from one of the trees overlooking the street outside the main perimeter. I started looking around, already panicking. Whatever was making that noise was no ordinary dog. It sounded much bigger, much more vicious, and I could tell it was close. By then, the sun had almost set, so I had trouble trying to see or distinguish much of anything around me. I looked towards the tree where it seemed to be loudest. Squinting my eyes, I just barely saw what appeared to be a set of bloodshot eyes glaring at me from behind it, glimmering in the glow of the approaching moonlight. That was all it took for me to turn and start trying to book it the rest of the way back to my house. It was useless, though, as I heard the thing give chase behind me, quickly catching up with me and pouncing, pinning me to the ground. 
The creature wasted no time and immediately sank its teeth deep into my shoulder. I felt excruciating pain shoot through my right arm before going limp. I shrieked and howled in pain, frantically clawing at him from behind with my good hand to try and pry him off of me. I finally succeeded by jabbing my thumb into his left eye, causing him to let out a dog-like yelp of pain and recoil. I then turned around and saw the beast for the first time. Sure as hell, this was the same creature that was described in the sketch on the news. But this wasn't a beast or werewolf at all standing in front of me. This was a man. Just an average, albeit rather tall and hairy and a bit more muscular, man. Like no older than 35. Despite this, his behaviour was like that of an animal. He glared at me, growling as he clutched the eye I'd put out. Before I could try and make another break for it, he was on me again. With a hard swipe of his left hand, like it were a giant claw, I was knocked once more to the ground. He then straddled me and began clawing and scratching viciously at my face. With every swipe I heard him growl and roar to the air, his own howls joining the chorus of the dogs. Everywhere across my body felt weak. My vision began to blur with each crushing blow dealt to my head. Oh, no, I'm done for. I thought as I slowly slipped from consciousness. And that, I think, was the first time in those couple of weeks since all that shit had started that I slipped unconscious without dreaming of the moon. I woke up, surprisingly enough, I don't know how exactly much later, to a police officer shaking me awake. Hey, uh, are you okay, sir? He asked. I groaned, stirring awake painfully. Oh, what the hell happened? I asked. I raised my neck up to look around. I was still outside the park perimeter where I'd been attacked. As well as this, I was still completely naked. What happened? What's going on? Well, I was hoping you could tell me. I told him I'd been attacked by a mugger who must have taken my clothes after beating me to a pulp. When I asked for a description, I kept the details as simple as possible. Tall, strong, fast, and hairy. For obvious reasons, I didn't say it was the wolfman who'd attacked me. I knew they wouldn't believe it. And not only that, but in all honesty, I didn't really believe it either. Well, not then, anyway. I mean, I didn't see a wolfman attack me. He was just a guy, right? Just a deranged freak with an animalistic bloodlust driving him, likely due to some split personality. But then... That begs the question about me, doesn't it? Could I also be suffering from something similar? Now, for the record, I've never once been known to exhibit any sort of symptoms of mental illness. Sure, certain ones were known to begin almost spontaneously, almost out of nowhere. But that wasn't the case here. Something I realised a while later after returning home from the incident. You see, after all of that, believe it or not, my sleeping problems were gone. From that day onward, up to the present, as I'm writing this, I've been able to sleep just fine. I also noticed the dogs weren't barking anymore. It was quiet again, just like when I'd moved in to Willow Lane. It was just this past Monday, though, that it started happening again. All through the day, I'd felt just fine, but come nightfall, I felt more agitated and energized than a ten-year-old hopped up on too much caffeine began having those dreams again too, not long after. It, the moon, keeps calling out to me, summoning me to join the pack. I still don't entirely know what that's supposed to mean, but one thing has occurred to me. Wherever this wolfman is, could it be possible that he was just like me at one point, a sane, normal, and stable individual? Could he too simply be a victim of the same sort of psychological avalanche that I was? Well, this brings me to the bigger and much scarier thought. Could someone else be next to fall under the moon's influence, turning them into a deranged animal? Regardless, I've locked all of my doors and I'll be locking and pulling the curtains on all the windows too when I finish. The dogs haven't started barking again, and I don't want to see the moon tonight, or any other night really. It's too bright.
too full. I'm... I'm scared of the moon. Okay then, my dear friends, what on earth was that all about? Uh, wolfman? Werewolf? Yes? No? Just someone's gone a bit crazy? I haven't got a clue what happened there. What was that all about? Any thoughts, feelings, anything you want to say in the comment section below the video to try and uh, figure that story out? I will definitely be joining the conversation with this one. And here we are on a Thursday for a change over here. There will be something again tomorrow night, and probably something at the weekend as well, but yeah, that was nice for a change, wasn't it? Something on a Thursday. Well. That's enough for me for this evening, my dear friends. Until the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me, and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can download my music on SoundCloud, um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like, throw me a dollar or two, very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, bye bye.